Hello and welcome to this installment of Unitas Fide. Today we are speaking with Dr. Mark Knoll, covering a book of his that fits within the category of historical theology. Mark Knoll is the Francis A. McCannany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame. His research is focused primarily on the history of Christianity in the United States and Canada. In 2006, he was awarded the National Endowment for the Humanities Medal at a ceremony held at the White House. Among his numerous publications are The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, The Civil War as a Theological Crisis, and Protestantism, a very short introduction. The work of Dr. Knowles that we are discussing this afternoon is the third edition of his Turning Points, Decisive Moments in the History of Christianity. This work gives accounts of and interprets a little over a dozen events that occurred throughout the 2,000 years of Christian church history. It provides brief introductions that serve as great starting points for further research into any of the treated subjects. So, Dr. Knoll, thank you for joining us, and I will get into our first question here to begin the conversation. I was wondering if you'd be willing to give a defense as to why the average Christian ought to study church history. One might think that studying what has taken place after what is recorded in the New Testament is fine for academics and historians, but they might be skeptical that doing so has real practical value for the everyday believer. What would you say to change that person's mind? Um, the book really originated as much in a church setting as it did in an academic setting. Um, I was asked at our local Presbyterian church to do some things on uh, general church history. And how, how do you do the whole scope of things in just a, a quarter or, or a brief period of the year? And then I was privileged to uh, be asked to, to go to Romania, actually, during the time when the communists didn't let in a whole lot of religious instruction. And there again, I was asked to do a general church history. So, uh, so how do you do that if, if you've got a, just a short period of time to cover a lot of material? And the, the solution that kind of came to me and others helped out was to do this idea of turning points. So you just take several uh, strategic moments. I began with the, the uh, fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD that pushed the Christian faith out into the broader Roman world, the broader Mediterranean world, and then came right up to the 20th century events. So the, uh, uh, your question has been one that everybody was asking when these talks were first given that eventually resulted in the book. And I think what, what uh, always impressed me with historical study of the church is that it reinforced the truth that Christianity is a historical religion. It's not just a set of precepts. It's not just some good ideas. It's not even the example that we want to have in our lives, but it's actually a religion that grows out of concrete historical events, in the life of Christ, obviously, Israel before, leading on then to uh, other historical events. So it, 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 in the first instance, just reinforces what Christianity is all about. And for me as a Protestant, however, uh, I think I, I find even uh, more interesting learning from the past when it comes to how we interpret our basic standard, our guidebook, our word of life, the Bible, in contemporary settings. So uh, the church has always professed to believe in, in the whole community of the faithful. And in, in our day, we do that by listening to people from other points of view, other parts of the world, how they interpret the scriptures. But looking back in time, you can say, well, the dead believers also deserve a voice in how we approach the, the scripture. So I'm thinking in this uh, year that's the 500th anniversary of, of the Reformation, we probably want to answer about how in the modern day we're going to interpret passages like Romans 1 or, or Galatians chapter 3 and when, when the Apostle Paul is talking about justification by faith. And then probably we want to, we want to see what Luther's opponents said about how best to interpret the Bible as well. So when we're uh, trying to understand what the scriptures say to us, it's very important, obviously, to read the Bible for ourselves, to talk to our nearby friends and fellow church members, but then also to have the advantage of talking to people far away in time as well as far away in space can be a, a, a really wonderful thing. I'm, I'm uh, to take as, as an example, um, in this 
500th year of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses, or at least promulgating the 95 Theses, uh, we think, well, Martin Luther's going to teach us a lot about what the Bible says concerning justification by faith. But then not too many American Christians today are going to say, well, Martin Luther's going to teach us a lot about how we should treat the Jews, because he was, he was pretty, pretty violent toward the end of his life about the Jews. And then there's not a, not a whole lot of American Protestants, Catholics, Lutherans are different, of course. We say, well, let, let's follow Martin Luther when he talks, when he ex exegetes the scriptures on baptism. Well, he, he's going to have a very different interpretation of what the scriptures have to say than many American Bible believers today. Now, what, what's, what, why do I bring this up? Do, do we want to follow Martin Luther on baptism because we think he has some key insights and justification by faith? Not necessarily, but we're going to be able to hear a voice that comes to us from out of the past that is obviously deeply committed to the scriptures, but is going to have a different uh, conclusion than many American believers. It's, it's the same with the, the Lord's Supper. Uh, Martin Luther thought that people who did not in the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper were just about as bad as infidels. Not too many American, not too many Protestants around the world, not too many Catholics around the world even uh, you think that today. So here's, here's a person who's really serious about interpreting the Bible, who really uh, is committed to the truth-telling character of Scripture, but has different attitudes. Are we better off by seeing how he interprets the Bible in these matters, even as we then proceed? We're not going to follow him necessarily, but we want to hear from him. It's the same on many, many other issues. You take any, any doctrine, any practice, any stance of the Christian church over against the world, we're going to have a more secure grounding than what we think the Bible teaches if we broaden the circle of those who are asking to help us as we interpret the scriptures. So that, that would be a, a major issue. And then the same kind of, of value, I think, comes when we, when we look at how Christian believers should be interpreting the scriptures, how Christian believers should be coming up with doctrinal formulas, theological truths that we think are most important that need to ground our lives as believers, and then how we as Christian believers interact with the world. Martin Luther is an, another good example. Most Americans, and now this would be uh, across all Christian denominations and even include some non-Christian denominations, Americans more or less take for granted that religious matters should be under their own protection and be separated from government matters. So we, we have no established churches in, in the United States. We think it's appropriate to have a moral influence in society, but we don't want uh, religious leaders telling people what to do. Martin Luther simply assumed that uh, the secular leaders, his prince, should help guide the church. Now, why did he do that? Well, it, it's very different circumstances, very different co conditions. But if we're, if we're aware that other Christians have approached matters like that differently, we might be in position to look from a new angle on how we're approaching matters. So that would be the Christian in political life, the Christian in work, the Christian in family life, the Christian attitudes toward entertainment. Uh, obviously, Luther didn't have the internet, but he had, there were new forms of, of entertainment and, and uh, uh, music and plays and things in his day. What, what do you think about these? And obviously, a, a church group can't be systematic and, and do a complete uh, kind of doctoral dissertation level on what the reformers thought about work and lending out money and interest in that. But questions are, are questions that believers have worked at in the past before. And if we want to be responsible Christians in approaching life in our world, we're going to have better insights if we understand how Christians have approached life in their worlds before us. These are some of the things. So I guess the general, the general point is to say that the, the, the community of the faithful includes a lot of people who are no longer on this earth. And that community of the faithful deserves a voice that not to dictate to us, but to help us as we interpret the scriptures and seek to live our Christian lives today. Thank you for that response, Dr. Nolan. As an evangelical who not that many years ago would have thought that studying church history isn't that important, your pointing out that the body of Christ doesn't just include the living is helpful. When we think about scripture here, the author of Hebrews mentions the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. 
And it's obvious that there have been countless devoted believers that have lived their life for Christ over the past 2,000 years. And it certainly is the case that they have valuable contributions to make to the spirituality of modern believers. Thanks for that reminder. The next point on which I was hoping for your comment concerns music. In your book, you speak at length on music and its role in the history of American Christianity. One of your turning points, actually, is the conversion of the Wesleys, including Charles Wesley, whom we know as this hymn-writing machine whose music had tremendous impact and is still sung in countless congregations to this very day. Uh, moving closer to the present, we think of charismatic Christianity and its distinctive brand of music that has been widely received in evangelical circles. Considering these points, would you be willing to reflect a little bit on the role of music in American Christianity past and present? Of course, it, it begins, a story begins before there are believers in uh, what becomes the United States of North America. Um, we, we know from the, the prominence of the Psalms in, in the Old Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures. We know from the injunction of the Apostle Paul to, to, uh, to uh, sing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord that singing has been important for God's people right back to the dawn of time. And that, that continued on in, in the Middle Ages before Protestantism, although not, not as uh, highly emphasized as would, would come. In the early days of the Reformation, the Protestants were known as singing people. There were different styles of singing in the Lutheran Reformation, different styles in the Reformed or Calvinistic side of the Reformation, different styles in England. But uh, in contrast to the Catholics, uh, Protestants wanted to sing, and they wanted the people, in line with the concept of the priesthood of all believers, to be part of the singing witness. And there have been really good actors suggest that the, the music that Protestants in the early days sang was as important as anything else in giving community identification, in, in, uh, in uh, informing or enforcing uh, Christian teaching, in, in giving a sense of, of identity over against the world as a whole. And then we mentioned what happened in the 18th century with the evangelical revivals and people like John and Charles Wesley. There's a, there is a bumping up of how significant music was from an already high place in, in the Protestant world. One of the things that really impressed John and Charles Wesley before their conversions in the mid-1730s were the Moravians, German pietists coming from the continent who were writing new music uh, and sometimes putting to use old music too, but very effectively. And on a long shipboard journey that the Wesleys took to Georgia, when it was a new colony in the mid-1730s, the Moravians sang during storms, and it helped them to be calm. And John Wesley particularly reported, I, he was scared out of his wits. And here's these Moravians calmly singing hymns that grounded, grounded their face. So right from their time in, in uh, Georgia, the Wesleys, John Moore is a compiler and editor, Charles is an author, were, were writing hymns. And, and that hymnody became, uh, I would say, almost as important for evangelical Protestants as the sacraments had been in the Catholic Church. It was affective in the sense of involving the emotions as well as the, 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 the mind. And with, with the uh, spread of a more evangelical faith in the English-speaking world, uh, hymnody became increasingly important as a way of bringing together divergent strands of strong Protestant belief. The generation before Charles Wesley had witnessed uh, the hymn writing of Isaac Watts, who had been a pioneer in the English-speaking world, not just in paraphrasing the scriptures to sing, which is what mostly the English had done, but writing fresh hymns, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross Upon Which the Prince of Glory Died. Um, Wesley took things even a little farther. He did write some hymns that were paraphrases of scriptures. Most of his hymns were scriptural in the sense of following out Christ, this Christian scriptural themes and then applying them to uh, uh, individuals. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Uh, and and the, the, the 7,000 or 8,000 or so of Charles Wesley's hymns almost all had that personal application of, of the gospel message. And that became a terrific instrument for expansion, for evangelism, for believers, 
or drawing in, in, uh, to, to the community of, of the faithful. Then uh, when, when Methodists came to America, they, they, were, they were not the only ones who were serious about singing in church, but they were leaders, and their music became one of the reasons why the Methodists grew so very rapidly in American history. There were a few hundred Methodists when the United States came into existence in the 1770s. By, night, by 1860, there were 20,000 Methodist churches, and they were far and away the largest uh, Protestant denomination. What happened with the singing, too, was, was an ecumenical effect. In England, real, there were real tense uh, debates between the Calvinists and the Arminians, and the Wesleys were Arminians, and they, they, uh, they occasionally would, would, you would see um, Arminian elements in the hymns, but not, but not very often because they, they, were, uh, they, they were drawn from the main themes of Scripture. And then there were Calvinist hymn writers like Augustus Toplady, uh, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. And the Wesleys and the Calvinists battled each other, but pretty soon, they were singing each other's hymns. And, and they could do that because the hymns were a, a, an emotional and an intellectual reflection on the truths of Scripture. And it, it, the story continues on, and you get, you get in the second half of the 19th century, the really effective uh, popularizers of, of Christian singing. Um, um, uh, Moody and Sankey team. Thank you. It was just as important as Moody in drawing together uh, the, the music of that day, Fanny Crosby, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying, as well as using quite a bit of the older Protestant music, and Sankey even used some of the older medieval music. But he did it in a sprightly, attractive way, and the, the, the association of lively, instructive Christian, <coughs> Christian music with major Christian spokesman like D.O. Moody became, became a, a very important part of American Christian life. And so it's just no surprise at all that when, after World War II, there were major developments in uh, particularly the evangelical side of the Christian churches, music would, would play a, <coughs> a large role. The Youth of Christ rallies had uh, some new music, and, but, but all the music was, was played in a sprightly, upbeat way. And then with the 1960s and 70s, you begin to get the charismatic influences on music, a lot of new music. And, and uh, what was a, a, a repetition is to see renewal of the church, outbreak of new music, new styles for both words and uh, the, the, the melodies and, and the, the harmonies that, that went with the music. So it's just not at all surprising that, that uh, moments of outreach, moments of expansion, moments of redirection in the church are accompanied by, or sometimes prompted by, changes in the music. There's a saying that's attributed to Plato. I've, I've tried to track it down. It's a little hard sometimes to track down, but the saying is, when the mood of the music shifts, the walls of the city shake. When the mood of the music shifts, the walls of the city shake, and there's no arena more than the Christian saying has been true. Thanks for that reply, Dr. Knoll. I found particularly interesting your comment that at a certain point it appeared that hymnody had risen in importance for Protestants to the point of matching the importance of the sacraments for Roman Catholics. That trend, in my opinion, has only strengthened in the present. In the evangelical context, which I'm, I'm including the, the Pentecostal and Charismatic, in my experience, it's been the case that most Christians I know base their choice of a local church largely, and in most cases mostly, on how good the music is. Uh, when speaking about this issue, people often rate a local church based on, and how it's worded is, how good the worship is. So someone might say, well, this church has really good worship, or this church has, has bad worship. But in reality, what we're talking about is how good the music is. Now, that leads me into a follow-up question uh, on something I'd like to get your perspective on. Now, in thinking of music, in our context, we... Uh, taken a lot of contemporary Christian music. It's referred to as CCM. Now, its role in modern evangelical Christianity is undeniable. Uh, now, it seems, thinking back on its history, I've read a couple books on this topic as of late and trying to learn a little more about it. It seems that it rose as a parallel movement to the the, the movement of in the in the 1960s and 70s of secular rock and roll, secular pop music. 
Now, young people were producing this rock and roll, and those out of that group that were Christian were producing a Christianized form of it. That music grew in popularity, and as those young people producing it became a few decades later, the people running their local churches, the Christian music of their youth began to hold a prominent position in their worship services. Now, this has been the case to the extent that now, a great many sanctuaries purposefully resemble concert halls. In Sunday morning worship service, uh, they look quite a bit like concerts. There's a stage with a rock band, the house lights are down, a multicolored spotlights illuminating the stage, the service starts with 45 minutes of music led by a band, and then that band comes back up for the last 15 minutes in order to facilitate the altar call. Now, that's not every church in evangelicalism, but that does describe a lot of them. Now, these are major changes, and these changes have significantly altered the way we worship God corporately. And these changes stem pretty much undeniably from secular sources. And for that reason, I'm just thinking that CCM, its origins, and you know, its rise, its impact on our worship is something that we ought to be educated on. So I was wondering if you could comment a bit more on contemporary Christian music and its strengths and its weaknesses. Well, the, the question about contemporary Christian music is really a good one for a historian. And of course, historians are by nature traditionalist and pretty conservative, so I myself, of course, like the hymns of the Middle Ages and Martin Luther in the 18th century more than modern things. But uh, I, I think what, what it, you can say uh, it, that is character of Christian music through the centuries is it's always had to balance appeal and rootedness. It's always had to balance uh, the need to uh, reach out and to expand beyond the, the church's circle of uh, established inherited people, and it's needed to be remain rooted in solid Christian teaching. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Charles Wesley wrote maybe seven or 8,000 hymns. Um, some of them, many of them, are not memorable. Many of them were just the ages doggerel, and, and they've been properly forgotten. The ones that have survived had that dual capacity to bring solid Christian teaching to the fore in a way that was effective and affective. So it's got the emotions and the, the mind together. I, I think that you could say the same thing about uh, the lyrics of contemporary Christian music. I think if, if you did this interview in 50 years with a younger person, I'll be long gone by then, they would say, well, you know, some of what was written freshly and new in the 1960s and 70s has become standards in the church because it combined that capacity to teach solidly and to affect people in any way. A lot of music that uh, was generated in that period it has gone by the wayside. In the same way that a lot of the new music of the 17th went by the wayside. Performance is a different matter, and I, I think performance requires, you'd have to get an expert on, on uh, music history and uh, musicology. I've uh, learned an awful lot from Larry Eskridge's book on the Jesus people, and that book is called God's Peculiar People or, or something like that. But it's really a good study of how uh, early Jesus people and then uh, folks like the Calvary Chapel of New Mansion intentionally used some of what had become customary in public secular performance as a way of broadening out the church's appeal. And here again, I, I think uh, it's a matter of staying on, on the back of the horse. You can fall off by being so traditional, no one cares what's happening. You can fall off by being so imitative of what are secular styles that there's no possibility of having a distinctly Christian application. But somehow using what is uh, a, a, a musical vocabulary that communicates along with having solid biblically-based teaching it is the key. And I, I don't know myself en enough about contemporary Christian music to judge individually, but I, I just know as a historian that there's almost certain to be a, 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 po a portion that remains and is edifying over time, and then quite a bit that just, just falls by the wayside. Christians live in the world but are not to be of the world. And that that, that uh, balancing act pertains to all sorts of things. It pertains to music as well. 
Thank you, Dr. Noll. Uh, you make a good point in highlighting the importance of maintaining both appeal and rootedness in church music. Uh, we must be concerned to be relevant to our culture, obviously. Uh, we need to deliver that message of the gospel through music in a manner that will be received today. That is important, but at the same time, like you mentioned, we, need, we, we shouldn't be so imitative of the culture that we lose our Christian distinctiveness, right? That we lose our rootedness in biblical truth. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, so thank you for that. Now, uh, going into question number four. Uh, the last topic I'd like to cover concerns Pentecostalism and charismatic Christianity. Most point to the Azusa Street Revival as the real starting point of Pentecostalism. Now, of course, we know that there were other Pentecostal happenings that predate the 1906 Azusa Street Revival, but, you know, pointing to that event, which a lot of people do, as the, the impetus for the, the major expansion, really the meteoric rise of charismatic Christianity. In just about a hundred years, the number now, and you quote this in your book from uh, Todd Johnson, who is doing um, you know, demography in this area, is that there, there's about 600 million Christians today who would identify themselves in a manner that they can correctly be categorized as charismatic. Now, this isn't just Protestants. It straddles lines. Uh, it includes Roman Catholics, for instance. But that's about a quarter of all Christians uh, on the globe today. Now, just thinking about this, this again, meteoric rise of Pentecostalism and the major changes that it has impacted the rest of Christianity with. I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on its origins, its expansion, and what are the features of Pentecostalism that is so appealing to the world at large? Yeah, obviously uh, a hugely important uh, subject for any, any consideration of the history of Christianity in the 20th century is charismatic uh, Pentecostal expansion. And then I think actually I'd go that by the end of the 20th century, it's not just Pentecostal and charismatic expansion, but Pentecostal and charismatic maturation. So it's in of Pentecostal and charismatic churches um, thinking about educating the next generation, thinking about uh, missionary strategies that include discipleship and teaching with evangelization. Um, I think it, particularly in places like China and Latin America and the African content, continent, most, most of the leaders who will be emerging in the Christian church, and this is often Catholic as well as Protestant, will be people who have in some manner or, or other embraced charismatic forms of, of Christianity. I take an insight from the British uh, Christian sociologist David Martin, who has uh, spoken about the, the, the Christian importance of what has happened in, uh, in, in charismatic and Pentecostal expansion, but also the sociological factors. And he, he, he has uh, advanced the theory that uh, forms of Christian faith relying upon an immediate presence of God have expanded most rapidly where the mediating structures of society and culture break down. So you, the, 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 the Protestant world of the United States was, was severely crippled by the Civil War in which faithful Protestants in the North and faithful Protestants in the South were killing each other. And, and the Protestant character of the United States never really recovered. And then it was battered by new waves of immigration, uh, economic upsets, um, cha very rapid changes in public life. And in those circumstances, Forms of Christian faith where the individual was able to connect with God directly through the work of the Holy Spirit had a kind of attraction that was not unknown in the past. There, there, there are charismatic type phenomena that go, that go way back, but would have a, a stronger uh, attraction. And then in other parts of the world where Pentecostal and charismatic expansion has been even more rapid than in the United States, you have more of those circumstances. So um, what I think... As a, as a non-Pentecostal myself, who yet believes in the Trinity and thinks the Holy Spirit has been given too little attention through the history of Christianity, I think what, what we have witnessed over the last century 
is a, a renewed emphasis upon the Holy Spirit as a full member, an active member of the Trinity. And then we've had different uh, ways of actualizing that emphasis upon the Holy Spirit. And so the sign gifts of the Spirit, uh, either in a Pentecostal form, a little bit more uh, formalized or charismatic, a little less formalized, have become a major part of world Christianity. Now, uh, in the book, it probably, uh, it was my uh, inability to handle the complexities of origins that, that made me not have uh, Azusa Street or something comparable as a, as a key turning point. Obviously, the spread of charismatic and Pentecostal faith is a huge uh, matter of importance in, in, the, in the 20th century. You mentioned the fact that, that even before Azusa Street, there are anticipations and I've been privileged to read a little bit of, of, of uh, literature from around the world. Uh, the late Nigerian historian Agbu Kalu, K-L-U, has a wonderful book called Something Like African Pentecostalism. And his argument is, well, people focus on Isuzu Street because, it, well, it is important, but, but also because most of the people writing about the history of Pentecostalism have been Americans who know about Isuzu Street. Mm -hmm. And he, he's gone into a number of cases where in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there were charismatic-like events taking place all throughout Africa, yet they weren't seen as part of one movement and written about by generations of historians. You can say uh, there, there were events also taking place in India uh, amongst uh, second and third generation Christians, uh, Korea amongst first generation Christians before Azusa Street in 1906 that, that pretty directly have fed into what's become the major charismatic emphases of the 20th century. So I had one chapter for turning points in the 20th century. I knew that the Second Vatican Council and Lausanne were important, and uh, probably, probably your questions are the kind that a professor should act at this, uh, ask at the start of, of, of a course that might use this book. When I uh, was teaching at Wheaton College and could use the, the turning points idea, one of the questions I always raised for students as a final exam question is, you're writing the textbook. What are the major turning points that this book left out and why would you put them in there? Which was always a good question for people and, and uh, very often folks that write about uh, Pentecostalism and, and charismatic movement. So I, I think, again, in another 30 or 40 years, there, there, there'll, be, uh, there'll be historical accounts that come from all around the world that will be able to explain uh, a little, in a little more detail, how the different Pentecostal and charismatic uh, impulses have, have originated, how they've developed, how they're in, interconnected. I would say just maybe, maybe one, one further matter is that uh, the Pentecostal charismatic category is securely in place as a really important interpretive understanding of, of recent world history of Christianity. But it's also, they are also uh, very much um, they're, they're phenomenon. They're phenomena with a lot of variation, and uh, although you can say a direct witness and work of the Holy Spirit is a common characteristic, once you're past that, you've got a lot of denominations, a lot of different emphases, a lot of different uh, 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 places on the spectrum of Christian belief and practice that Charismatics and Pentecostals inhabit. So. I guess I'm saying that was, that was a complicated job, but I just, I just wasn't up to it. Thank you for these comments, Dr. Knoll. It certainly is the case that although Pentecostal, is, excuse me, Pentecostalism is a major current force in Christianity that demands study, it is also a multifaceted movement with tremendous variation, and that necessitates caution on the part of the historian or just the, the student of Christianity that is attempting to explain its origins and expansion. Now with that, we have concluded our discussion of Dr. Knoll's book, Turning Points, Decisive Moments in the History of Christianity, the third edition. Viewers at home, please consider picking up a copy and educating yourself on church history. It's of utmost importance. And also keep in mind that this work would make a great resource for a study group at your local church. Dr. Noel, thank you again for joining us and discussing these important topics. You're very welcome. It's been my pleasure.